Good evening, everyone. I'm Hal Scarab, and I'm the Vice President of the York Sunbury Historical Society. Our guest this evening is Jennifer Stein. She's the mainline coordinator for the Mutual UFO Network. It's called MUFON. It's an international nonprofit organization dedicated to the scientific research of the UFO, unidentified flying object phenomena, for the benefit of humanity. These include UFO sightings, psychic experiences, crop circles, and the mystical experiences of higher states of consciousness. Jennifer is a documentary film producer of Travis, the true story of Travis Walton. And as a special gift to our viewers, Travis will be joining her in this presentation to honor Santa. Travis is an American forestry worker who was abducted by aliens on the 5th of uh, 19, November 1975 in Arizona, which is where he is right now, I believe. After search parties used scent dogs and helicopters to look for him for five days and six hours, Travis reappeared by the side of a road near Heber, Arizona. He will join us for the question period. Jennifer's goals include helping the awakening of the human family to our multidimensional nature of reality as we advance in our understanding of the purpose of our lives. This includes understanding how UFOs and crop circles fit into this bigger network, even though we may not yet be able to properly understand them. Welcome to our viewers, Jennifer and Travis. Over to you, Jennifer. Thanks so much. So thank you all for coming tonight. It's a real honor to be here and to, uh, to be presenting. I'm going to start here. Um, and it's really an honor to be able to talk about Stanton and the influence he had both on my life, but I know I speak for many, many others, and I know I'm one of several people who are speaking about him. Um, and I will point out that he was an incredibly gracious and humble man. I was with him many times when he was presenting and he was on panels, and I never ever once saw him wield his like academic or professional experiences over other presenters as happens so often in this field. He never attempted to belittle or intimidate other people or make accusations about them. And it, that was unique. Uh, Stanton set the bar high for a lot of us. He impressed us, he motivated us, and he modeled for us. He was, of course, a very distinguished scientist, as many of you know, and he was willing to address this very controversial topic of UFOs, which is a strange field. And he did it with a no-nonsense approach. He would quote documents. He would you know, show archives in his presentations. He would provide scientific resources. So you, as an audience member, could go and look up the material yourself. And he always encouraged you to do that. And he was never afraid to debate anybody on this topic. And because of that, he became a mentor for me as well as many other people. And Stanton himself was always willing to learn new things. You know, he never would uh, say, oh, well, you know, I don't know anything about that and you don't know what you're talking about. If he didn't know about it, he'd listen and he'd usually go look it up. He also testified before congressional committees on the UFO subject, both in 1968 and later. And he, uh, when he did, he made this statement that he believed that UFOs employed magnetohydrodynamic propulsion systems and that really our um, US military should be exploring and studying that. So he actually presented uh, as part of a very unique presentation that took place at the UN. The other people who were there were J. Allen Hynek, Jacques Vallée, Lee Spiegel, and also one of our people joining us tonight, Peter Robbins. This was a, a presentation done on UFOs where they actually brought information to the UN and suggested that the United Nations um, all around the world that countries address this subject and come back to the UN and present on it. That, of course, never happened. It was kind of a, 
once and done uh, event. Um, Peter can probably speak more about that later and you can ask questions of him. But this is a great picture of a very young Peter Robbins who was there on a reporting mission for a paper that he worked for. And he's standing here with his parents in the UN. So it's long before I think he really met and became friends with Stanton, but uh, I love this picture. So I included it. S Stanton also presented before the citizens hearings. Some of you have heard about in Washington, DC. I believe that happened in either 2012 or 13. I was not there myself, but both Peter and Stanton presented. And this is a picture where you can see both of them there. Stanton began speaking on the topic of UFOs really almost full time in 1970. And because he had a background and was a nuclear physicist. So he had a huge scientific background and he worked for top level uh, companies like General Electric, Aerojet General Nucleonics, General Motors, Westinghouse, TRW Systems, McDonnell Douglas. And in many of those cases in those companies, he had to have security clearances. So he well understood how secrecy in private um, in companies works and how they can compartmentalize different aspects of work so that people can be working on different things that then fit together later, but they have no idea what the end result of their work is. And I remember listening to conversations with him on that, which I'll mention later, but I'll explain that once he started speaking on the topic, he was in Louisiana at a lecture in 1978 and someone from the audience came up after the show. He was a radio station manager in Baton Rouge. And he said to Stanton, do you know that second Lieutenant Colonel Jesse Marcel Sr., who was the main person who went out to the Roswell crash site, is alive and lives only an hour from here and is a friend of mine. And I could introduce you if you'd like. And of course, Stanton canceled his plane reservations the next day. I think he drove over that, that evening and they met Jesse Marcel and a long relationship began. And this resulted in a book that Stanton wrote called Crash at Corona. I believe it, the first publication was 1997. So it was about 10 years worth of research that went into this or more, maybe a, a little more. And he, uh, um, really changed the world with this book, Crash at Corona. It stimulated many, many, many things to happen. First of all, it really opened the Roswell story because it had been very, very closed uh, and it was a tightly secret, you know, um, a story up until that point. Donald Burson, who is a New Mexico state section director for MUFON, had this to say about um, Stanton's work on that. He said, um, obviously, Stanton was one of the most important and productive people in the UFO field. He was the first person who found and interviewed Jesse Marcel back in 1978. And if that hadn't happened to this day, we wouldn't know anything about Roswell. The whole thing was covered up so thoroughly. It was silenced. Stanton opened that up and the effects of this were just amazing. Obviously, there, we would be in a whole different world, you know, uh, if Roswell's information never came to the forefront. So many of you are aware of the Roswell story. These are pictures of Jesse Marcel uh, Sr. Um, and you're aware that he was sent out in the field to um, just to find what was reported by Mac Brazzled. And he brought back literally a car full of debris. And then um, that debris was flown, you know, away. And he was flown to Fort Worth, Texas, I believe, and told that he was supposed to sit in front of some weather balloon debris and claim that what he actually found was a mistaken uh, weather balloon, which is absurd because this was the 509th bomb squad. They were putting up weather balloons all the time. It was obvious to them. They knew what a weather balloon looked like, especially the debris of one, because they fell all the time. And one weather balloon would not have filled his entire car. So it's obvious anyone who puts up, you know, thinks about this in more depth, they can see the reality to it. And Stanton's research uh, actually inspired 
and continued to inspire many books, movies, and I believe also the establishment of a, a museum. This museum was underway when Stanton was beginning to work on his book. In 1990, Walter Halt, who was, or Haut, H-A-U-T, he was the public information officer at the Roswell Army Airfield in 1947. He was the one who promoted the idea that somewhere there should be an archive and a museum of all of the Roswell you know, evidence that was coming forward. And he met with another man named Glenn Dennis. Some of you may know that Glenn had worked for the local Ballard Funeral Home in 1947. And he answered the phone when he was called by the Roswell Air Force Base. Uh, they requested four to five small children's caskets to be delivered there, which is a very unusual thing for the uh, Roswell Air Force to call and ask for. So um, as a result of that, they were, of course, key people in this story and Stanton met with them, interviewed them and talked with them in the writing of a number of his books, as did many other researchers like Donald Smith and Tom Carey and mm, um, Kevin Randall. So many people have written on this on this subject very accurately. So a local realtor uh, found this location and in 1991, they incorporated the Roswell Museum and it opened in 1992. And this museum has played a key role in the town of Roswell. I mean, many, many things have changed as a result of that. Um, I have attended many uh, uh, conferences there as has Travis. And this is Jesse Marcel Sr.'s grandson, uh, also named Jesse Marcel III. His comments after Stanton passed away were, our family was deeply saddened to learn about the passing of Stanton Friedman. Not only was Stan the original investigator of the Roswell incident and instrumental in opening the case, but he always re remained a close friend of the Marcel family. When Stan tracked down my grandfather, Jesse Marcel Sr., and they spoke in that telephone conversation so many years ago, I'm sure they had no thought of what a wave of interest would follow. And the museum has definitely proved that there has been a wave of interest in this topic. Every year, the Roswell Museum attracts uh, upwards, or it has traditionally attracted upwards of 10,000 people uh, every year to come to this museum and to come to conferences. And this is a little video I will share. Let me turn down the volume in it so I can talk over it. This is Stanton learning how to ride. Um, oh, I forget what it's called, but you you know what it is. It's like these little, you know, single uh, tr transporters around. One of our friends who's a great drone helicopter, Gary Holloway, is taking him around the museum. I thought you'd be interested to see this. Stanton was never afraid to have fun. I'll just point out that the Roswell Museum's, you know, establishment has been going on or, you know, ever since it opened its doors, it's had annual conferences. And Peter Robbins was actually running one of those conferences uh, one year for the city of Roswell, the mayors had hired him to come in and run their wing or their end of it. There was, you know, of course, parades and speakers and films that would show and festivals and, you know, costume um, uh, competitions and things like that. It's really quite amazing to see a whole entire city, you know, turn into a festival for a week or two. But you can imagine the number of hotels and restaurants uh, that opened as a result of this. So um, when I was there in 2010, helping as an assistant to Peter, I actually met Travis for the first time. We went out and had dinner together. And Peter and I looked at Travis along with my other friend, Ruben Udiarte, who was there. And we said, you know, Travis, why don't you have a conference up in Snowflake, that's a small little town, both Snowflake and, and Heber and Holbrook, they could probably use some economic stimulation, you know, maybe we could get something started. And that's really how this whole film ended up starting for me. Um, I'll jump ahead here to the next slide. This is Stanton being honored at the um, UFO Museum when he retired, which I think Stanton did about four times. <laughs> possibly in Rosweld. But Rosweld and the people at the museum loved him and he was um, literally an icon um, and a real movie star to most of us 
who loved his listening to his presentations. Stanton was also a regular contributor to the MUFON Journal. And I am a MUFON member. I'm a state section director of MUFON. And I founded a small organization in my hometown called Mainline MUFON, because I live on the main line of Philadelphia. And I've been hosting for 20 years speakers who come in and present in a local library. Uh, up until the days when COVID hit in March of uh, 2020, we met at a local library. Now we've been doing it on Zoom as you're doing as well. And both Travis and Peter and Stanton were all presenters for me in the past here in Philadelphia. So my relationship with Stanton began in the spring of 2008. I um, was starting to work potentially on a project with a local producer here in, in the Philadelphia area who wanted to produce a program on UFOs. And um, I said, well, why don't you go to the best? You know, let's, let's bring in Stanton. So I looked up his schedule and lo and behold, in a couple of months, he was gonna be in New York and then he was gonna be in Ohio. And there were like two days in between, he didn't have anything scheduled. And I knew he wasn't going back to Fredericton. So I called him up and said, hey, we wanna to come to Philadelphia. So he came, he presented, and we proceeded to start to interview him for a project um, in that I will tell you about. So this is a picture of him. Uh, I drove him to Reading where he was speaking after my, air, my, my presentation. And he loved the fact that he, his presentations would sell out everywhere. So this is a picture of him in front of his sold out sign. And he said, Jen, you got to get a picture of me. And I said, okay. So I brought Stanton uh, into Philadelphia to begin a project called First Contact. And the idea was that we would put three ufologists together who between them had about 75 years of experience. It would be Stanton Friedman, Richard Dolan, and Peter Robbins. And they would travel the country in a RV and uh, research UFO cases. It was kind of like UFO hunters, but before that happened. So we shot a pilot. This is my uh, co-producer here in the Philadelphia area named John Doria and one of his assistants, Frank, along with Stanton. And what we did is we brought everybody into my house. Uh, they stayed with me. I cooked with them. We ran around Philadelphia uh, in an RV and uh, shot the, them talking about the UFO subject. Uh, we had a, a gal join the, the show lineup. Her name is Connie Willis. She does a lot of uh, internet radio these days, and she's still prominent in the field and a lovely woman. So we, we shot this pilot and uh, just here's some great scenes from it. Bob Terrio is in the middle here between Stanton and John Daria with the, with the gray hair. Uh, gray blonde hair. He's also a co-producer on the Travis Project with me. And we really had a lot of fun. Uh, we also hung out in a diner. And one night we, we had we had to shoot in the diner from like, uh, like maybe seven, eight at night till about four or five in the morning. So you can see we're all like half asleep. Connie is asleep sitting there. And we're discussing how we're shooting things because that's the only time we could have access in the diner to shoot. Plus we also shot in my home and we also went to Washington DC and we were covering basically for the initial launch of this show, we were covering the UFOs over the Capitol that happened in 1952 and again in 2002. And um, just these are just some casual pictures. I, I will say that during the shooting, Stanton gave his wife, Marilyn, uh, my cell number because he said, look, if there's something going on and you know somebody needs me or there's an emergency, just call Jennifer. So I can't tell you how many times my phone rang in the middle of things. And you know, I had it on vibrate and I'd pick it up. And sure enough, I didn't know who it was. I'd answer. And it was some person I didn't know. And they were like, is Stanton there? Is Stanton there? And I would say, well, who's calling? And it would be like, you know, NBC News, it would be Ted Koppel, it would be Nightline, it would be Larry King Live. And I would say, oh, okay, hold the phone. And I would go over, hand it to Stanton, and they were looking for comments. This happened constantly the whole week. And he was very humble about it. But it kind of made us all kind of sit back and go, wow, you know, Stanton really changed the world. And he was the go-to guy when people wanted information on the topic. So uh, it was a humbling experience to have this opportunity to work with him. And uh, we, you know, it's just some more casual shots 
uh, we tried to keep them comfortable and fed and uh, happy the whole time. This is us shooting in front of the Capitol. And <clears throat> I will tell you that the first contact series was actually, we were working with a, um, a man named Larry Landsman from Sci-Fi who wanted the series. He brought it to his uppers at uh, his uh, network and they loved it. They wanted it, they greenlit it. And within two or three days of that happening, Sci-Fi went through a financial restructuring and our whole project basically ended up in the trash can. And we were all really sorry about that. Um, and I've given the museum the opportunity to show this little uh, sizzler. It's about a 20 minute piece. So if you decide to put it up in a video room, I think it would be fun for people. It's really quite well done. And uh, I just spoke with John Dora the, the other day and he was excited to know you were interested in, in sharing it. So after that, um, I invited Stanton and Kathleen to come to Philadelphia because we have an, a wonderful uh, archive library here called the American Philosophical Society. And there are many people's archives there that are connected to the UFO field, as well as many historical people in our, say, our nation's history. People like, you know, Ben Franklin's archives and Thomas Jefferson's, and we also have Donald Menzel's, and we have um, uh, Edward Condon's material, and we have Philip Class's material. Now, Philip Class was a major debunker of UFO stories, including the Travis Walton case. So they wanted to come in, they were working on a book, um, and they they were considering writing a book about Philip Class, and they wanted to come in. So the book, all of us spent about four days there about, you know, going through files. Uh, interestingly, Philip Class and, and Stanton had over, I would say, a thousand communications back and forth over, you know, 20 years. They had none of the correspondence with Stanton in Philip Class's file. So Stanton promptly made it available to them. Whether or not they officially added it, I have no idea. But um, for those of you in the UFO field, it's no easy feat to get your material archived in a prestigious institution like the American Philosophical Society upon your death. It takes quite a bit of money to do that. And I, as you probably know at the, at the Fredericton Museum, what you've put into just getting this museum show up, it's, it's complicated and no easy feat. So that just goes to show you that there are powers that be that have a meme or have an intention that uh, the reality of the UFO story is not one that wanted to be, say, archived because they only had people that were debunking the topic there in their archives and not people like Stanton Friedman or even the communications that Stanton had with Philip Class. So we found that very interesting. So I read documents there for days, including days and days and days of communications that Mike Rogers had with Philip Class. It's interesting. I've told uh, Travis about this in the past. The result of the, much of this work went into a book they created called Fact, Fiction and Flying Saucers with Kathleen and Stanton. And I was really honored when the book came out that on the second page of it, they gave me a lovely credit thanking me for hosting them when they were doing this research. And of course, I was very grateful because I suddenly learned the ins and outs of archives in a way that I would have never learned had I not had that experience. So this brings me to the Travis project, which I was working on, and for which Stanton, uh, I'm very, very grateful, Stanton and Peter Robbins uh, really made a huge impact. They were both associate producers on this, and Stanton really worked with me for a good five years, as did Peter. I would run stuff by them. I would ask them to check facts for me. I would, you know, and, and Stanton put me in touch with someone he worked with on the Travis project very early on. This is a great picture of Stanton and Peter when they were in Brazil uh, a number of years back. But Stanton worked on a film called UFOs Are Real that was done by a producer in Hollywood named Brandon Chase. And he was asked to be basically a script writer, a researcher, a tech consultant. Um, and to come up with, you know, what is going to be the body of this film. And basically, this is a cover of what the film looked like when it came out. 
it uh, covered three major significant UFO stories, which have stood the test of time for many, many people who research in this field. And that was Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens had some experiences when he was in the military and then went on to research other stories and became a prolific writer on the subject, the Travis Walton case and the Betty and Barney Hill case. So this is a little film clip that of Stanton when he appears in Brandon Chase's film. So I'm gonna play it for you and then we'll move on. Hearings on UFOs is California nuclear physicist Stanton Friedman, who spent 14 years in private industry working extensively on classified government sponsored projects such as this nuclear rocket engine and other advanced space systems. Since 1970, he is the only space scientist known to be devoting full time to UFOs. After 21 years of study and investigation, I'm convinced that the evidence is simply overwhelming that our planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled vehicles whose origin is off the Earth. In other words, some UFOs, underline the sum about 10 times, are somebody else's spacecraft. I'm only concerned with those UFO reports which indicate things of definite size, shape, surface texture, whose behavior clearly indicates that they were manufactured somewhere other than Earth. The kind of behavior that Stanton Friedman is talking about is the ability to go 10,000 miles per hour in the atmosphere as observed on radar and make sharp right angle turns. Nobody on planet Earth is able to duplicate that behavior. So you'll probably know that there was some uh, recent um, government documentation that came forward where the military has admitted basically the same thing. But you can see how far ahead Stanton was from his time. This film came out in 1979, uh, 1978, 1979. And this is exactly what they're still talking about. You know, the, the propulsion systems, the, the speed with which these objects uh, traverse um, and the maneuvers that they make is what really makes them stand out. And that's what's in, in the news today with Luis Elizondo and the, uh, and the Pentagon. It's, it's nothing new. This is another short little clip. Uh, I don't believe there's any volume to this. I took the volume out, but this is just a uh, Travis and some of the other crew members. Stanton actually went to the site to, to visit and interview uh, Travis and Mike and spoke with them. Uh, they both appear in this film called UFOs Are Real. And uh, let's jump ahead here. Oh, so this is a tiny little trailer. I'm sort of, I guess, tooting my own horn a little bit, but it's a short little clip that gives you an idea of the impact of the Travis Walton documentary that I did. Um, it's, it's been well accepted in film festivals when I put it out there for about two and a half years, I put it in different film festivals, which is about the limit you can do. But of the 50 film festivals I presented it to, it won awards in more than half of them. And I was shocked by that because usually UFO films don't even get admitted into um, film festivals. So this is a short little trailer, one minute for the film. And I was just in no condition to, to talk to anybody. I thought he was dead. These hardworking, tough blue collar guys, even though they were friends, there was a falling out, and one way or another, um, Travis lost his life. We better be certain. So we can get in a lot of trouble. I thought we was going to go to jail for murder. The question is, what the hell happened to this young man? It was very emotional at that point. You know, your mind just... This takes off. This is Travis. I'm back. I need help. I think that they all are trying to tell the truth. What would you like to have come of this? Just acceptance of myself in the future. So, see, I don't think this is another little film. Four basic rules oh, yes, for UFO is. debunkers. 
Travis has run into all of these. Don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. What the public doesn't know, I'm not going to tell them. If you can't attack the data, this is particularly true in Travis's case, attack the people and do your research by proclamation. Investigation is too much trouble. You know, it. So that was, of course, Stanton, who felt um, really great compassion for not only Travis, but all the boys on this work crew whose lives were really totally destroyed by this event happening. And I think they really would have wished it hadn't happened. I'll see what my next piece is. So this is, um, I also took the sound out of this little video, but it's a short clip to give you a understanding of where this event took place. It's seven loggers encounter a craft of unknown origin in the forest in a clearing of trees about 20 feet off the ground. And uh, Travis, of course, um, is a nice little clip of him here. He's curious. He thinks this craft is just going to fly away. So he jumps out of the craft and run, he jumps out of the truck, I mean, and runs right up under the craft um, to see it. The other loggers are sitting in the truck going, Travis, you know, hey, whoa, we don't know what this is. Get back in the truck, you know, like, please. And Travis actually squats down. Well, first there, he stands there for a minute, looks at it, then he kind of squats down behind a logging pile. And uh, he decides he has to jump up and run back to the truck. And at the moment that he does, this happens. As soon as he brings his body in closest range, you know, quickly, maybe the craft was thinking he was doing something defensive or threatening to it, he gets hit by this beam of light. All the guys in the truck are shocked. The whole forest lights up uh, as if it's daylight. Travis gets thrown back. The boys describe it as looking as if he was hit by a grenade. One of the guys, John Goulet, had a, uh, been in the military and he'd seen explosives go off. And he said it was like he was hit by a grenade or something, or as if a bomb went off. He flew through the air like he'd been hit by a car or a truck or something and landed without any attempt to break his fall. And once he landed, he didn't move. And the boys in the truck were frightened. So they jumped up and ran away. This is also just a little, you know, some little video segments I put together to kind of describe this scene uh, for you. It doesn't really appear in, in some of the films that we've, that we've produced, but it's pieces we had done and never really got used in the film. So he squats down behind what's called a slash pile, which is what the boys would do to do timber uh, stand improvement. They would create things to be burned, piles of logs to be burned. So Travis is standing behind one, stands up, gets hit by this light thrown. The guys are fright frightened to death. They slam the door of the truck and drive away because they figure they're next. And Mike Rogers, who was the crew boss thought that he was responsible for everybody's life. So he had to kind of take them, them away. So next, what we describe and what Travis describes in his book is what happens to him. Um, the, the boys, of course, drive away. They then decide they have to go back and pick Travis up, even though there's something weird going on. They see the craft fly away because they're above it now looking down. They can see it in the forest. They decide they have to go back and get Travis and take him to a hospital or something. So they drive back to the, the scene and Travis is nowhere to be found. And eventually after looking for him for about an hour, they go into town, call the police. Some police go back with them. They can't find him. A five day manhunt basically ensues or four full days and then they call off the the manhunt and they give the boys in the crew polygraph tests because they think they've probably killed Travis and hit his body and some argument broke out and they're all lying about it. So meanwhile what happens to Travis is this big question. Travis wakes up on board a, a craft but he thinks he's in a hospital. At first he doesn't realize that he's you know, in some odd place. He thinks he's being cared for. He wakes up, sees these beings looking down over him that he first thinks are doctors. Then he realizes they're not. He, his eyes can finally focus. He sees that these are gray beings over him and, and he manages to get enough strength to roll off the table, grab some tools and start to defend himself. 
Sorry, Travis, if I'm battering your, your piece, you can tell, tell us later. But this is basically what happens. He's frightened, he grabs a tool, and he tries to start to defend himself. These beings pick their hands up, try to maybe mentally control Travis. They don't, they're not able to. He, Travis is hollering obscenities at them and screaming at them. They finally look at each other and kind of walk away and leave the room he's in. So Travis decides to also leave that room, which he does. He walks, he's trying to find a way out of this craft. He walks into a, another room that looks like a round room with a central chair in the middle. He walks in and tries, and, and this graphic is done by Mike Rogers. He walks in and tries to um, figure out if this chair has any kind of controls on it that he can use to open a door or get out of this craft. While he's in there, this other being comes in. I think I have some other pictures of this, yes. And this person looks human. He doesn't look you know, like a gray, uh, like you first saw. And Travis thinks, oh, great, I'm being rescued. You know, NASA's come to get me. You know, it's an astronaut, somebody I can talk to. And he runs up to this person thinking they'll communicate with them. Person doesn't communicate with them, just takes them by the hand, leaves, leaves them out of this craft into what's like some kind of a hangar. And Travis describes seeing the craft he saw in the forest. They walk down a small ramp. Here's another artist drawing that was done of this. They walk down a ramp and Travis sees other craft in this hangar or a large greenhouse room. They walk across a tarmac. Travis has no idea where he is. And he's led across like a, some type of flooring into another, through another doorway into some building he thinks is maybe some type of medical facility. And he encounters two other beings who look human, who put a mask over his face, and then he is uh, knocked out again. So we have no idea how long this period of time is, if it's two hours, if it's 20 minutes. Travis was going in and out of consciousness when this was happening. So I have a short little film clip that sort of describes this for you. And I think this is some of the most important and significant things in Travis's story, which have um, you know, fascinated UFO researchers because this was long before people were talking about two different types of beings possibly working in coordination with each other. So I'll play this little film clip that's about two to three minutes long. When I regained consciousness, I was in such pain that it would actually sort of knock me back out again. The pain. I knew something was terribly wrong with my body. I couldn't move, but it was so difficult. But I felt I was probably safe in a hospital that they, I was being taken care of. There was some sort of device across my chest. I had a lot of pain in my chest. I can hear the sounds of movement around me, and I just took this to the doctor. Then when I looked in the direction of the movement sounds, I could see furry forms that I thought were doctors wearing surgical caps and, and masks. So when I sharpened the focus in my eyes, I could see that was not the case. I was looking at the face of this creature. And then I knew I was in very great danger. And here, the space was so close to me, another right behind him. The fear gave me the strength to raise my arm. It pushed the, the one that was standing close to me back, and he fell into the other one. I was rolling away from him, and this object across my chest fell off. I got on my feet and staggered back, and I bumped up against a shelf, and there was an array of instruments laying out there. I just glanced, grabbed the biggest thing I could find, and started flailing in their direction to keep them from coming any closer. That moment was the focus of my nightmares for months afterward. They stopped with their hands extended towards me and staring in a way that felt invasive and intrusive, like they were looking inside of me. It was horrible. I came to realize that it had to do with the stare, and the stare was them trying to reassert control, I think. Once it was apparent they weren't going to physically or even telepathically control me, they turned and left the room and uh, went to the right. And so I went in the opposite direction that they had gone. 
immediately behind me where they were swimming near was around this tight loop curve that I couldn't see more than a few feet ahead. Uh, was I going to run into something worse? Adding to the panic was this feeling of suffocation. This feeling was about to pass out from lack of air. I came to a doorway and looked in. I was fearful of the chair in the middle. It was a high back chair, and I was afraid there could be someone sitting in it. So when I moved to the side and could see that there was no one in it, then I moved towards the chair. And it was then that I realized that the closer I came to the center of the room, the walls, the floor, the ceiling were darkened except for points of light. It was a planetarium kind of a projection. My main concern was open these doors. But I assumed that perhaps the the buttons that were on the arm of this chair might open the door. That means the star pattern. I was already unsteady on my feet. I turned and there was a, a man in the door. He had this glass helmet over his head. I started towards him, battling questions and trying to tell him what these creatures were. He took me by the arm and was leading me out. We went through what I think was a, an airlock. You know, this door closed and that door opened and we went out. At this point, the craft we came out of was parked inside of this big hangar like building or it might have been part of a larger craft. He led me towards the vertical wall opposite this, through some doors, down a hallway into a room where there were some other people. They were very similar to him. A similar dress, similar coloring, light colored hair, light colored eyes. They're leading me, taking me by the arm and putting me over towards this table. Uh, I was in a weakened condition that I felt their strength, but still the panic I had at being restrained like that, I was able to jerk one hand free and they put this mask over my face and I got my finger under the edge of that trying to pull it away. But before I could pull it away, boom, I was out. <laughs> So <clears throat> that's a very concise, compact uh, onboard the craft memory. So what happens next for Travis is he wakes up uh, along the side of a road and he's not quite sure where he is, but he sees a light around him. He looks up at this light thinking, well, maybe it's a street lamp or something. And it's not. It, the light zips up and goes into the bottom of this craft. He sees the bottom of the craft close up and the craft is shiny. And he can see the bottom, he can see the road that he's lying on reflected in the craft above him. And he finds the energy to stand up and he walks down the hill, uh, going downhill, he sees lights, he realizes it's the town of Heber and he walks basically to the closest phone booth and he makes a collect call to a family member telling them that it's him and he's, you know, please come pick me up. Um, it's quite an emotional uh, story to, to go through. I've been through it many times with, uh, with Travis and I did an in-depth interview with, with him where he explained this all. And um, basically from that point forward, Travis has tried to make sense of what happened to him. And that's what's included and written about in his book called Fire in the Sky. Some of you know Tracy Torme did a film also called Fire in the Sky in 1993, produced by Paramount Pictures. And it's a decent film, although it fictionalizes the story and some of the characters in the logging crew. And um, because of uh, this experience and of course writing the book, Travis still faces tremendous ridicule, uh, disinformation, debunkers, and he deals with it as graciously as almost anyone I know. And I don't know how he puts up with it. And uh, as well as a number of other members of the crew, they still are accused of lying. And of course, this broke apart the logging crew. They never went back, back to work. It destroyed their lives. And I think that's really what I put together when I did this documentary about them, because it was really intent to show the human side of the story of what happens dealing with these types of scenarios. So in, in doing the film, we decided to go back to the site and do a site exploration to see if there was additional information or evidence we could find. And we actually discovered something that Travis knew, but we weren't quite sure what the cause of it was. We, uh, we knew there was rapid tree growth in the area and actually, let's see what the next little clip is. 
Um, this is an aerial shot. We took an aerial photographer back with us. We filmed all around the site for a couple of days while we were there. We discovered that there was almost like a rapid tree growth that had some unique effects to it. And I think the next little film clip will describe that. So rather than describing it and showing you the film, I'm just gonna show you this little film. In the summer of 2014, we went back to the site to do a field survey. It's been so many years since the original incident that we really did not expect to find anything there. But while we were on the site, a discovery was made the calculations show that these trees were producing wood fiber at 30 something times the rate they had in the previous 85 years. Other trees uh, exhibited the same kind of changes and the effect diminished the farther you got from that spot. Not only was there an extreme growth rate to some of these trees around the clearing, but it seems that there's also a directionality to them. I started checking stumps at the four corners of the compass and discovered that there was a swelling and a thickening of the growth rings in the direction that the craft had been and not on its opposite side. That was where the thickness of the rings were at the minimum. Travis and some of the, the original people who, who did the first surveys had posited that possibly the, the cell growth was caused by radiation. I took that a step further and, and did some digging to see if there's been any academic studies done on radiation and tree growth. And I found at least one or two related to the Chernobyl incident. A university out of Poland did a study in 1997 that found trees that were exposed to radiation after Chernobyl had grown up to three times in volume of accelerated growth as compared to previous years. Our field survey and finding this directionality and impossible connection to radiation opened a whole lot of new doors that need to be explored. So we were hoping that we could get one of the forestry universities in the uh, Arizona area, either Arizona State or University of Arizona, who has a ontology, I believe they call it, uh, for tree ring growth. It's a, it's, it's the technical term for studying tree rings. I'm actually an alumni of the University of Arizona, and I couldn't get them to pay attention to me. I showed up and asked them <laughs> to help me with this. I wrote them. I sent them this Poland you know, a picture, or I mean, I'm sorry, the Poland research and asked them if they would look and at the tree ring growth evidence we had and see if there was any correlation. And um, they escorted me off the campus with campus police. <laughs> I don't know why they wouldn't discuss it. They closed their doors to me and asked me to leave and so that's, that's history. Maybe eventually at some point, there'll be some stimulation for research. But this is my way of thanking both Kathy Martin and Stanton Friedman, and also Peter Robbins and Travis for helping me make this film, because it's really, I think, helped to let people understand the real details of what happened in Travis's case. We put this film in the International UFO Congress's Film Festival in 2015, which was the 40th anniversary uh, at, of Travis's event. And we did this to help promote a conference that Peter and I uh, helped to organize and run. And also Karen Bard and uh, Alejandro Rojas also ended up helping to run the 40th anniversary, which they did an excellent job of. So it was really a team effort and I'm a collaborative filmmaker. So when I won the award at their film festival, I asked everyone, who was present, who was there in the audience to come up on stage with me. So this is just some pictures of the award. I think this is Travis just moments after we accepted the award, sort of, you know, also saying, well, you know, what can we say? Jen did a lot of digging and she did a decent film. So it's really a great moment with Kathy there, myself and Travis. And this is of course a picture that was snapped there. And this is later in the evening. We also all got together and took a couple pictures. So I really will and always continue to express my gratitude to uh, everyone who helped on this film. The reenactments that were done that you just saw on board the craft were done with Ron James, who's uh, standing here also holding one of the awards. So I think that's where I'm going to officially end and invite both Peter and Travis and Kathy Martin to be able to come forward and answer questions if people want. 
First one from Sasha to everybody. I'd be curious to know if he's ever dealt with sleep paralysis or out of body experiences prior and post abduction. And uh, any of you comment on that? So I think that question might be directed mostly directly to Travis about sleep paralysis. So I will turn it over to Travis and let him answer that if he wants to unmute himself. As far as sleep paralysis, you know, you could draw analogies to a number of states that I was in during my experience. But um, um, after that, other than the actual hypnosis performed by uh, Dr. James Harder, um, I, I couldn't draw any analogies in that direction. And I've heard about this phenomenon, and uh, uh, but it's very often used to uh, suggest that there was a kind of a hallucinogenic state that a person might get into a sort of a um, paralyzed state in their in their dreaming and and think that there's something else. But I, I don't know. So I, I I've never experienced that myself. Another question there for you again. Have you ever drawn sketches of the look and the layout of what you saw? The gray beings, uh, the room you woke up in, the room with the chair and the map, hallway, hangar bay, the human looking beings in the room they led you into. Uh, were those images that uh, the artist put together, do they match what you saw or are they close to it? Well, they're close. It's very hard, to, even for me, to remember perfectly. I, I did quite a number of sketches which were greatly refined by uh, Mike Rogers and even a couple of other artists, but uh, um, as best I could, I, I laid it out uh, as, a, as I recall it happening. But you do have to understand that my, my focus at the time had a lot to do with survival and what, I, what was being done to me. I wasn't just gee whiz looking around like a tourist uh, and taking notes. <laughs> wow. Um... Uh, Chris would like to know what uh, you think of Tracy Tormey's version of his experience as portrayed in Fire in the Sky. Is that for me? Yeah. Yes. I think you're going to be oh, well, the, most of the questions. Thought, you know, for a, uh, a serious Hollywood studio to take on something of this nature um, was a major, major step forward. Well, of course, Hollywood wanted to emphasize the invading monsters aspect, which, you know, wasn't that far off from the way I felt about it at first. But as time went on and I realized there was a, a much more um, intellectual, uh, uh, more subtle uh, interpretation of events that it's really pushed me to want to uh, uh, respond to some of these um, people who would like to do a big budget remake of Fire in the Sky. Yeah. Um, Tabitha is wondering, did, it, did you have any incisions? Did you think that there was anything left in you or taken out of you from the experience? Um, there were no incisions. Um, there, was a, there was a puncture wound that the doctor said was on my right arm, but the, and the important, factor there is that it was not over any major blood vessel. So the idea that, you know, working in such a job, a lot of thorny brush, I could have been poked by some other source it had nothing to do with the abduction. See, um, Sasha is asking many abduction experiences report that this happens across generations along the same bloodline. Might be a little personal, but uh, are you aware of anyone else in your family also having had an abduction experience, parents, siblings, children? Well, I'd have to get their permission to <laughs> discuss that, that sort of thing, but um, I definitely think they are uh, keep an eye and on and identify individuals as far as persons, which is ooh, a far cry from what I thought at first. You know, I, I used to draw the analogy of uh, if you're walking by an anthill, would you say, oh, I'd like to have a conversation with that ant right there. And, I'm, you know, how nonsensical it was for people to act as if uh, the UFO was responding to them 
I move this way and then it moved that way, that sort of thing. I, I thought that was kind of egocentric, but, but now I realize they're far, far too intelligent for any of this to be random. I don't think they slapped their forehead and go, oh, ah, human saw me again. I guess I'll have to be more careful next time. Do you have the sense of the sightings are, are planned, they're uh, intentional. Harold, I'll interject a little bit there if I can, Please. Uh, if Travis doesn't mind. I did interview Travis's brother, uh, his older brother, Don, in 2015, and I actually asked Don that question, and Don said to me, no, uh, that as far as he was aware, no one else had anything like this ever happened to him, although occasionally there were other sightings. I will also tell you uh, that um, both Marlon Gillespie, Sheriff Marlon Gillespie, and Deputy Ellison, who were on the case, uh, you know, investigating Travis mm -hmm. while he was missing, and they were part of the search teams, they both said to me after I did extensive interviews with them, if you turn your camera off, Jennifer, I will tell you some of my own experiences. And Travis was there when we interviewed Marlon Gillespie, and we turned the camera off, and Marlon went on to describe some of his own experiences he had. So this area, the, the Mogollon Rim, where this event took place is a very, very high plateau. It's in uh, the largest ponderosa pine forest in the world. It's a um, huge landmass that probably was created by uh, earthquake activity that happened maybe over a million years ago. It stretches from parts of northern New Mexico through southern, or I should say through northeastern Arizona and straight on up into uh, Utah and, and Colorado. It's huge. And um, lightning strikes happen there, probably more than anywhere else in the United States. It's really quite an unusual geologic area. Is it so, far from Sedona, which is a really an hour magnet. and a half, an hour and a half, it's, maybe that whole area is a real yeah. magnet for people who are drawn to the energy of the place, if I can put it that way. And well, I, yeah, I, I think it's a very interesting area and many people who live in that area have had experiences. So I just thought I would interject and I'll also say publicly, since this is being recorded, I have given the museum permission to actually show the Travis film, uh, if they want to do it as a fundraiser or as a, an, an event, a public event there at the museum. And if I'm available, I'm happy to, to pop in and do questions afterwards. But probably a lot of these questions that are coming up will be answered by people who want to see the film. It's also available for streaming on Amazon if people want to go there. And if they have Amazon Prime, they can watch it for free. So it, it is available. And um, of course, Travis can sell you a DVD if you go to TravisWalton.com or you go to TravisWaltonTheMovie.com, you, you could buy the, the film and see it. Not that people need to, but so I'll let you go back to questions. Thank you. Well, again, uh, it's generated a whole bunch more between the two of you. Uh, Travis, one of the big questions is you were injured. There was a device on your chest. Were you burned? Is there evidence of the burns? Did a medical examiner find any damage to your chest from what was on you? There was no scarring in the aftermath. I did feel a great deal of pain and uh, difficulty breathing, chest pain, all that during the event. But by the time I regained consciousness back on Earth, uh, that had pretty much, uh, for the most part, uh, gone away. Have you ever received an MRI to check for foreign objects in your body? This was from Tabitha. Yeah, I did. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, the MRI and the e, uh, EEG were, uh, you know, a very, very high level professional. Uh, you know, done at Barrow's Neurological uh, Hospital. Uh, it's uh, probably the premier brain uh, injury institute in, in, the, in the United States. Sasha asks, have you remembered anything else over the years of what happened while you're missing? Have you had partial memories or in dreams? Uh, you said yeah, that you attempted- little, little, little glimpses of stuff that I wasn't sure of the meaning of it. It wasn't uh, a part of the more frightening memories. Did you but, go through uh, post-hypnotic suggestion, uh, regression, that sort of thing with a professional? I've done one hypnosis with Dr. Okay. Uh, somebody, uh, Jason is asking, how far is the fire tower from the abduction site? 
And was there anyone present in the tower that night that might have seen the same thing you saw? I think, well, Jen, you said it was a long ways away. It was almost four miles away. It's yeah. totally ridiculous. And behind a hill. Um, and it's their job to look for such things. But um, we worked rather late that night. And I think quitting time for the people in the tower would have been five o'clock. Uh, whether they immediately left there and ran home, I don't, I, I can't say. But uh, the idea that 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 was any part of this experience is just absurd. Yes. Well, uh, people can, believe what they want to believe. Sorry, Jennifer. I, I'll also interject. Part of that question was: Were there any other witnesses that night? Well, now, yes, there was, and um, they reported it to, uh, to me uh, through the mail. Uh, that's that's why we did things back then. There was these pieces of paper with stamps on them that would come to you from the post office, and that's how people communicate. We didn't have cell phones, so <laughs> uh, there was a uh, a guy that was uh, at Black Canyon Lake, and, and there was also a uh, couple. Um, uh, who, uh, who worked in military intelligence, uh, um, who were deer hunting in, in the area at the time, who also saw it. And both of these uh, reports and some others that that um, Sheriff Gillespie had on file, because they didn't just contact me about this, they also contacted the sheriff and reported it to him. So um, uh, the sheriff had record of these people saw the craft depart in the direction that the crew described. It's one of those occasions where every answer to a question generates five or six more questions. Uh, uh, I Bear just, with I, me. If, if I can, I also just want to interject because yes, this, please. Is a, this is a slam dunk as far as I'm concerned in Travis's case. People need to understand that um, in 1975, if these seven or six loggers were accused of murdering Travis, even if he was never returned or they didn't find a body, you didn't need a body to get a death sentence in Arizona. Arizona. So the boys could have gone to jail for life or they could have faced the electric chair. So the willingness of this undercover agent to come forward and, and confirm that he saw the same thing they saw with his wife, he was doing this because he knew that these boys' lives were in danger. Yes. And he wanted to come forward and his superiors said, wait, you're basically an undercover FBI agent. You don't let's let's just hold off on your testimony unless we absolutely need it. But there wasn't other witnesses uh, that evening. So the boys were not the only one. There's a lot of accusations that they possibly hoaxed this event or that they mistook a fire tower at night. There have been serious researchers, including Stanton Friedman, J. Allen Hynek, Leo uh, Sprinkle, you know, for decades who have gone over this fact and fact and fact again, including the police there. So um, the, the testimony does stand up. Based on what you know now of the experiences of uh, abductees like Travis, what would you do if you were abducted? How would you act? And what would you recommend that a person being abducted do during the experience? Serious question. I'd like to know too. Most people who are abducted are um, under some kind of, in you know, intense forced psychological, emotional control. They're paralyzed. They are unable to move. If they have any memory of it at all, um, many people have no memory of it, and they discover after the fact wounds and things like this, and then memories start to seep in, and they think they're crazy. So this is a really strange field. And um, I don't think I could have a plan. Now, Kathy, you know, tells the story in the book Captured that her aunt, um, Betty Hill, actually had the wherewithal to calm down, talk to the director who was directing what was going on while she was having bodily experiments and said, you know, where are you from? And she almost convinced him to give her a book she could take when she left the craft. I think that's a fascinating part of the story. Then the guy goes on to describe a map where they're from, right? This ends up becoming the Marjorie Fish map. So it's, it's quite an interesting question. I don't know who or, you know, who would have the 
wherewithal to have that level of consciousness when you're engaged with a, a species from another planet. Most people are just in total shock and fear and disbelief of what's happening to them. So yeah. I'll also say Aaron does have his question up, who is yes. Stanton's nephew. Aaron? Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, my question was, um, did the did military intelligence follow you afterward? Like, or did, did they keep like uh, keep tabs on you? And it's kind of another question that as well. I mean, how is your your eyesight today? I just kind of two questions uh, crammed into one. But Travis, but I've always I've wondered like as far as your eyesight, how whether it was affected. And then another one, kind of unrelated was you know if military intelligence did find you in any way, did they did they continue to keep track of you? Yeah, I do have information that military intelligence was uh, investigating the case and uh, developed a file on it. Uh, probably more than one agency, uh, one branch of, the, of those things. Uh, and uh, my eyesight has been excellent. Uh, and, uh, you know, I uh, have to take a vision test when I get a driver's license. And it was totally perfect for this last uh, um, renewal of my license. Another question for you, Travis, if you could go back in time, would you stay in the truck or if you came face to face? Absolutely, another crap? I would stay in the truck. Um, just a second, questions, uh, the experience, uh, stand by one finger problem is here with the ghost. This one's for Jennifer. The experiences of abductees you have spoken with appear to vary widely, widely, as in some of the aliens seem to communicate by spirit, some through a form of mind control, and some verbally. What is the most common experience when the aliens communicate with the abductees? I'm not an abductee expert, so I would say, you know, that's something you really need to explore with someone like Kathleen Martin. I myself uh, had an experience and it was really more of a spiritual light engagement experience. Um, I was also not alone at the time, but didn't know it. But, um, and I was only really able to recall these incidences under hypnosis. I don't think I've ever talked or discussed about my experiences with Travis, although Peter has heard me describe them. Um, when I was 19, I encountered a craft that was a rectangle, which made no sense to me. It was about 90 feet long and about eight feet high or six or six or seven feet high. Who, who knows? It was a long rectangle, a brilliant white light. And um, I probably just lost consciousness and probably, and I know I lost time. I lost about an hour and a half of time. And that was in 1975 before Travis's experience. So um, I think for every person, it's really quite different. And if they're interested in that, there's lots of great material out there to explore. Kathy Martin's a great source and uh, there are a number of other people. So I'll, that's as far as I'll go on that question. Well, most of the people that I've talked to on that particular question would say by far uh, the communication is telepathic. That, that is, was my impression from many that I've spoken to as well. But my impression also uh, from Kathleen was that Betty actually spoke with the people that talked to her. So there's that area. Uh, question for Peter Robbins from Sally. Has anyone else you and Travis spoken to encountered the visitors in the same gray and human combination? We've seen three sets of uh, visitors, different types and kinds and sizes working together on at least one sighting here in New Brunswick. I think that's part of why they're asking. Um, a good question, Sally. In the years that I worked as Bud Hopkins' assistant, we, we certainly had a lot of um, cases that involved the smaller ubiquitous beings we refer to as gray, and occasionally um, humanoid type beings. <clears throat> as far as the absolute specific of mixture, a few, um, again, thinking back 30 years or so off the top of my head, I can't give you any details, but yes, um, a few cases where there was probably a similar mix, but I'm sorry to say offhand, I, I can't quote the details. Question again for Peter Robbins. 
What did you think of the recent Pentagon report? Um, as far as the content of the uh, redacted, highly edited version that went out to civilians and the public at large, as Shakespeare might say, much ado about nothing. Uh, yeah. It essentially hypothesized, and none of us kid ourselves, this is all highly stage managed and somewhat theatrical. The forces that be have a, as good an idea, certainly as I do, about what's going on. But the basic gist of it was, gosh, it might be the Chinese, it might be some new Soviet secret weapon, um, but who knows? I guess there's some chance it could be something really exotic. Um, I would imagine that the full version that went out to members of Congress, the House presidential uh, appointment um, people, folks obviously within the Pentagon military industrial complex, contained substantially more. But more important was the fact that there was a report. And I am guessing the first of many. And they will be, again, stage managed to appear that we're giving you more, a little more information each time when it's my intuition and best educated guess that it's just a way of stretching out the time. Um, the fact is that they can't trot out all of the old explanations that kept people at bay for decades, in part because the ridicule factor that kept so many people quiet or in their place out of fear of being made fun of, in some cases, jeopardizing their careers, yes. can no longer yeah. be played. A yeah. reasonable person will not say, oh, gosh, I guess it is swamp gas or a reflection on a cloud or a beam of light from a tower 3.9 miles away or a mass hallucination. So they're, they've lost control of the narrative. The best they can do now is slow it down. And I'm sure there will be more information coming, but let's face it, the secret keepers, those who move the chess pieces, the inheritors of the folks that started repressing all this material 74 years ago, some of them are probably not happy to see this power transferred to the people. I think it's inevitable that disclosure per se will happen, but don't expect it to happen in a uh, kind of from, you know, a point of view of a scene in some glorious movie where the president goes to the microphone and tells us all we're not alone. If so, I, I think that's some time off. Yes. Um, I would like to say something in the defense of my former profession. It is very similar to what the medical profession is. At first, if you can, do no harm. And again, based on previous experience, when you scare the living daylights out of people, they tend to do unthinkable things. And there was the acknowledgement within the community that I was aware of within the military, and I didn't have the experience, others did. We spoke freely about it. Uh, we didn't laugh at each other because everybody who's been deployed has had some kind of unusual, difficult experience. Look at all the people who got PTSD. But the idea being, okay, they're moving at 10 to 20,000 miles an hour. They can stop on a dime. They've always got the ability to do things that we cannot. They haven't, as we can tell so far, interfered with us in a way that causes a great deal of harm. And the only time harm happens is if somebody tries to hurt them. You start shooting at them just because they're strangers. It doesn't make them feel good and they'll defend themselves. So the best thing to do is try and downplay it so that people don't interfere with it, make a mess of things and get themselves hurt. And as Travis just noted, if he had a choice to go back and do it again, maybe if he just stayed in the truck, it wouldn't have been quite as horrible as it was. On the other hand, he had an experience that gives us a bit of a window on what we can expect when we come across it. And maybe, just maybe, the releasing of that information a little bit of the time is for our own good, not just theirs. This one is for Jennifer and Travis and Peter from Anne. 
What would Stanton think of what is happening now? I'll, I'll jump in. I think Stanton would be thrilled. I know he was thrilled on December 16th, uh, you know, 2017, when the um, article broke in the New York Times, the Washington Post about the Pentagon, you know, program called ATIP, you know, Aerial Threat Detection Program. He was excited that it was finally beginning to break and be considered significant in the mainstream news. And, um, you know, I would like to say that I think it's because of people like Stanton, who continually over the years spoke all over the world at, you know, at nauseam at universities and, and even professional organizations, major institutions, aerospace industries had them come and speak. I mean, everybody was curious about this and they wanted to hear about it from someone who was as articulate as Stanton. And I'll say this again, and I'm sure Peter and Travis would confirm this, because of the professionalism and the humility that Stanton had, he put the bar high for all of us. And he also had his ego intact. This field attracts a lot of uh, what I'll call wannabes, you know, overnight successes, like suddenly they decide they're going to study the UFO field and they're an expert in a month or two, right? And then they start debunking other people's stories. And it's really sad and crazy because there's not a lot of information or I should say hard facts available readily. You have to go and dig for them and you have to really study cases like I've studied Travis's case and like Peter has studied the Rendelson case and, and other cases. You have to go and dig for the information. But if you pay attention to the facts, you stick with the facts, you don't make stuff up and you d use as much archives and, and scientific information as you can, you're going to um, you know, get to the bottom of something if you really want to study it. And that's the bar that Stanton set for us. And he was a mentor to me, and I'm sure he was a mentor to Peter and others. And so I think Stanton would have been thrilled to see what's going on. And he would have said, don't let up the pressure. We have to continue to demand this. And he would ask for and look for congressional <laughs> hearings on the subject. And we may very well see that in the future. <laughs> I have to tell you, just for a moment there, you not only sounded like Stanton, you had his accent for a moment. I could hear him speaking to you. Honestly, yeah, it was just that was uncanny. Uh, I want to jump uh, back, Travis. Uh, the enormous number of comments that I'm seeing here on thank you for joining us and answering straightforward questions. And I hope none of us put you on a spot that made you feel uncomfortable. But uh, it was extraordinary having you here. And I want to say that I'm not seeing anything negative. It's all wow. Are we glad you came? Hope you're doing well um, or have gotten better. I'm not sure what that's about. But there's a, an enthusiastic pouring out of, we are very pleased to have had you here to join us with this. And Jennifer, thank you for making this happen. And you're for Peter, bringing it back to our reason for getting together, uh, Stan Friedman, uh, he was always very professional, but uh, deferential to the uh, uh, investigators who had already initiated uh, coverage of my case, but nevertheless, um, he uh, in 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 personal um, contact, uh, so to speak, of uh, speaking wherever he spoke, uh, it was always top notch. And uh, I got to say that when he passed, uh, I actually wept. I can understand that. Uh, he was really loved. Yes, I would Jennifer. also say, I think Peter would like to say something about Stanton because Stanton also was a mentor and influenced Peter and encouraged him to do a project that I ended up helping Peter with, uh, the uh, the documentary on James Forrestal. Would you like to say a little bit about that Peter, work, please. Peter? Yeah, I, um, I first heard Stan speak in 1978. I was a little more than two years into my uh, interest in the work. And it was, as Jennifer described at the beginning of her talk, um, at a special meeting of the um, Secu United Nations Security Council Special Political Committee, where uh, the small uh, Caribbean nation of Grenada 
had finally had a motion accepted to put forward a proposal for a standing committee to study the subject of UFOs. That's simple. Um, Stan was one of several distinguished speakers, including J. Allen Hynek, Jacques Vallée, um, um, a Lieutenant Colonel Coyne, uh, an Army uh, helicopter uh, officer whose helicopter had been involuntarily pulled up something like 1,800 feet above where it wanted to be over the state of Ohio. And um, the astronaut Gordon Cooper, his statement was read into uh, the event because he was kept from landing in New York because of a snowstorm. I digress, though. I was very impressed by hearing Stanton Friedman talk. Stan had about the longest formal introduction. I mean, thankfully, he didn't ask the introduced the person introducing him to name all 600 colleges and universities that he spoke at, but it could run two minutes, which is a long time. And I remember at one point, it was at a conference, uh, Experience or Speak conference in Maine seven, eight years ago, talking about the civilian contractors he worked for, and I this, this one, that one, General Nucleonics, et cetera, and I go on. And ladies and gentlemen, Stanton Friedman, he comes up, he gives me a big hug, and he says in my ear, General Nucleics. <laughs> um, Got to be correct. You've he always had time. Correct. He always had time for folks who wanted his time. Uh, yeah. He was very generous with real newbies. Um, as Jennifer said, he set the bar high. Um, what she was referring to was in 1987. I became very interested in the subject of America's first Secretary of Defense, a man named James Vincent Forrestal, yes. who was a character for me. Had he been fictional, he could have been Jay Gadsby, um, <laughs> out of the great Gadsby. He literally was a very small town boy from New York State, Irish American family, who rose through dint of hard work, good luck, connections to become the second most powerful man in the world, period. And then descended into kind of a Greek tragedy, um, had a profound breakdown, was institutionalized, was recovering, was near recovery, and we're told by history that he, at the last moment, decided to take his own life. And I began a research project that was inspired by a talk I heard get Stan give in 1987 about the secret life of another well-known American, a man named Dr. Donald K. Menzel, who on the surface looked like um, um, a great respected academic. He was head of astronomy studies at Harvard, but Stan managed through, through Harvard and through the um, widow of Dr. Menzel as well as through combing the National Archives, that the man lived an absolutely double life as an asset of the national security community, as well as, you know, fronting as this very distinguished scientist, which he was, but he was kind of the godfather of UFO debunking. And Philip Klass was his protege in many respects. <laughs> yeah. And um, I told him I was, had come this interested in Forrestal, and that his project had really inspired me about um, the excitement of quietly researching something in a library or location or archives or digging through microfiche, because I started it in the old analog days. And it ended up um, as a presentation, which Jennifer and um, our, our dear colleague, Bob Terrio, who was uh, the cameraman, uh, on Travis, the true story of Travis Walton, essentially took it over and turned it into more than a dramatized reading, but a heavily illustrated, scored, one-hour documentary, a modest documentary, but I think an effective one. And I have Stan to thank for inspiring me to do that. Um, I was terribly saddened when he died, he had become a good and true friend. And two years before, he had had an episode 
with um, his heart and he ended up having a stint put in. Uh, I, of course, you know, sent him an email, but being old school, I also sent him a get well card and being old school, he sent me back a note. I knew that Stan's parents had each lived to be 90 years old. And the note said, dear Peter, if I'm off, it's by a word, dear Peter, doing fine. Both parents live to be 90, one another eight years, all the best, Stan. Well, he got another two years. I don't know anybody who used their time better. I know some folks who are lucky enough to use their time as well while they were here. And he, um, he passed doing what he loved doing. And yes. can we all be that lucky in life? Uh, yes. He will always inspire me. I will always remember him with a smile. He had a wonderful sense of humor and loved the adventure of doing the work as much as doing the work, the traveling, all the people that he got to meet, and fighting for what he believed in. What an incredible honor. Uh, and that was what this whole series has been about, honoring Stanton. Thank you for making the fourth presentation in our Memorial Speaker Series a success again. Absolutely fascinating. If you have any questions, you can always contact us, contact us at the Fredericton Region Museum. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us, and have a good night. Look after your mental health and keep safe. Dark star in the night, glowing, moving into sight. Engines pulsing as you land, bright star gonna make a stand.